My name is Patsy Horton and I am the programmer here at the Living Hall. And this is one of a series of lunchtime talks that we have throughout the year. This event is being held in partnership with the Northern Ireland Science Festival and we're delighted to be partnering with them and especially in this big birthday year for them uh, when they are 10. Um, and as part of the festival and an event today, I am delighted to welcome uh, Neil Powell, who is a brilliant scientist, storyteller, and who loves and understands dogs in his bones. So we're very lucky to have him here today. Um, he is a dog training and dog behaviour specialist. His dogs have participated in every kind of search and rescue over the years, from mountaineering rescues in the Moor Mountains to helping to find victims or at disaster sites, including, for example, the Locker Bay bombing. Neil is also a senior trainer for disability assistance dogs and is currently conducting groundbreaking research in the School of Biological Sciences at Queen's into whether dogs can be used as an early warning system for people living with epilepsy. Today, I'm delighted to say he's going to be drawing on his personal experiences and his scientific research to show us why dogs really are our best friends. And um, if you enjoy this talk, and I am sure you're going to thoroughly enjoy it because Neil is fantastic, but Neil has his book available for sale at the back of the room, and he'd be happy to sign them for you at the end. But um, I'll, I'll let Neil get on with his talk. And so, Neil Powell. <laughs> Very much, Patsy. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> First of all, I hope we don't let you down. I, I, I do my best to tell you about these wonderful creatures. Um, dogs are my first love. Um, and my first love was actually a cat that my dad got me many years ago. And um, the thing about dogs is that I think we're only scratching the surface with them in terms of what they do for us. And there's actually studies that show that dogs do want to help human beings. Um, various studies have shown and demonstrated that. So I thought what I'll do is I'll split this into two parts, really. The first part is to talk to you about how we use dogs to help us uh, find people who are missing on the mountains or in, under the water or in flat structures. And then I'll talk to you a wee bit about the research that we're doing at Queen's. Um, and where we're going with that research at the moment, because we're, I'm still back there. Even though I'm ancient, I went back to do the PhD um, eight, seven years ago, and the difficulty was you're surrounded by all these young people who are super brilliant, uh, and I'm not. And so basically it was trying to work my way through the technology, which is going to let me down here probably today. But anyway, I'll do my best. So the thing about dogs that has astonished me is that they have an extraordinary sense of smell way beyond anything that we really fully comprehend in my view as it says there dogs were trained to find this particular chemical and what they did once they trained it, there were three uh, giant schnauzers and once they had trained the dogs to find this chemical they started to dilute it and dilute it and dilute it until it got down to 1.4 parts per trillion now that means that there's a trillion bits of water and 1.4 of those is the chemical and the dogs were still able to find that. That is an absolutely astonishing capability in my view. Some people say dogs' sense of smell is 100 times greater. Well, the more research I've done, the more I'm convinced it's way beyond that. Um, and it's somewhere between those two figures there, 10,000 to 100,000 times greater. And the thing about the search dog is that when we train them to find a particular um, substance, whether it be drugs or explosives, whatever it is, people, make, people have made the mistake in the past of thinking, well, if we reduce this chemical odor down to the very bare minimum, and then train the dogs to find that bare minimum, and um, it'll make it a lot easier for us. I don't know why people think this, but anyway, the result of that is that dogs have been very confused. There was one experiment done 
where explosives dogs that were trained to find a plastic explosive were trained on the basic constituent parts of that were three three basic chemicals that give off these gases and they trained the dogs on those three basic gases and then they took the dogs out and they exposed the dogs to actual plastic explosive and the dogs couldn't find it and that's because when dogs are uh, imprinting themselves on an odor we have no way of knowing what um, array of odors they're actually imprinting on so if you can imagine um, a particular substance has like say 300 chemical parts to it all these little gases coming off and you train the dog to find that substance we have no way of knowing how much of that 300 group the dogs are focusing on could be 50 could be 4 could be 500 we don't know so therefore that creates certain problems for example with drugs dogs <coughs> drugs dogs at the airport or wherever sometimes give false what's what's called false indications in other words they say this guy here is carrying drugs so the police or whoever is to take them away check them there's no drugs on the person but what they have is a cash of money that is legitimate but it is possible that that money had been handled previously by somebody who was dealing with drugs and the odor will stick to the money. And so people are getting arrested, probably falsely. Here's a, a degenerate person who's just come in to join our group here from Newcastle. <laughs> so oh dear. Anyway, so that's very important to realize. So first part of the talk <coughs> excuse me, is about um, Sarda. I'm going to choke here. <coughs> oh, excellent. Uh, <coughs> I promise. <you. coughs> so organized. <coughs> <That's good. coughs> Excuse me. So, sort of, Search and Rescue Dog Association Ireland North is a charity that's been going out for about 50 years, and the charity trains dogs to do various tasks, basically search for missing people, and. One of the, the, the first one we did was training about and search dog. Now, it's done by this process called operant conditioning, which is basically uh, breaking the end. So the dog is trained, as you'll see in a minute, to search for a human being on the mountain, find where they are, then come all the way back and find where the handler is, should he be a half a mile away or a mile away, bark at the handler to say, I found the person, and then on another command, kick the handler all the way back to wherever the person is. So what you do is you break that uh, end task down into tiny steps and you reward each successful uh, mini, mini task. And that's basically operant conditioning. So the dogs are trained to find human scent. And human scent has been blown on the wind. So what we do is we will train the dogs to search across the wind, but they will only look for human live human scent. Now a mountain rescue dog is trained to find live human beings will still find a dead person up to about 36 hours or thereabouts after death. Now that's a very good figure but it's in and around that and after that the scent picture starts to change into cadaver or, or um, decomposition and the dogs whilst they still recognize this is something strange here will demonstrate a kind of an indication to the handler but it won't be the normal one. So the handler has to be switched on to looking for that. So when we train uh, or select the dog uh, to do this sort of work, we usually choose puppies that have come from a long line of working dogs. So Labradors, Shepherds, Springers, whatever. And basically they're taught that this ball or this furry kangaroo or whatever it is, is the most important thing in your life. The only time the dog sees it is when we play with it. Then the toy is put away. So gradually the dog will form this bond with the toy, whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and you see a little shepherd there, he was totally freaked out by that slipper. Um, and this sweet tiny one here was an absolute freak out for, for a football. 
which she struggled um, to, to pick up, but she did her best. So once the dog is focused on that toy, then we will teach him that the person he's looking for has run off with his toy and he needs to find that person to get his toy back again. And that's really, there's, there's nothing, uh, it's not a great human gesture and it's hard for dogs to go and look for missing people. It's just that they want their toy back. <laughs> and so building the connection between the pup and the, and the table tennis ball is, is something we would do very early. And this little guy here is only eight weeks old. Um, and basically all we wanted him to do was to show interest in the toy. Now, that little dog there is called Buzz. Do you mind your way, isn't it? Um, he's called Buzz, and he's now a fully qualified mountain rescue search dog. And he is, or he's actually, um, what do you call it? You would call it now an urban search dog or clap structure dog. So he's now assigned to the fire service and will search for people in uh, class uh, structures. He's also part of the international team, which is called SAR Aid, which is Search and Rescue Assistance in Disaster. So all the future training then is based on that connection between the toy and the need to find the person that we convince the dog has the toy. The type of dogs that we would use um, in SARDA are these. So a fair big array of dogs. This actually, I used to think this is a Mali, a Malinois, but he's actually a Dutch herder. This guy up here is a mixture of bloodhound and something else. Um, and Paddy, he's dead now, but he found something like 15 people in his day. And um, then you've got a Springer, Border Collie, Gold Retrievers, Labradors, and German Shepherd. And German Shepherds, the problem with German Shepherds is, and Mali's is that they're super bright dogs. But they need a lot of control, so uh, it's easier for people to go for the little the gun dog type breeds. So it takes roughly two years to train the dog to go and search independently of its owner. So when the handler says find him, the dog goes and that's it. The handler has no other control over the dog, especially at night or in bad weather. The dog will search independently uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the handler. But the dogs are always and they're constantly being monitored that they're safe around people and they're safe around livestock. We do a very, very intense testing of the dogs around livestock, uh, around sheep, uh, deer, or cattle, or whatever. Um, and the dogs have to pass two tests. One is in the field with the farmer, the sheep farmer, uh, down in Glasswoman uh, outside Newcastle. And he's very meticulous about what he does. And then the second part is on the mountain. And we, we set somebody out beyond uh, the sheep um, and upwind. So when the dog goes out to search, the first thing he gets is the sheep. And so we're looking to see will he run around the sheep or through the sheep, but he must not go near the sheep. And it's all done in a very controlled way. And the sheep belong to the same farmer, so, and he's there with his, with his own dog as well. So, Sarda out in the north, uh, we're, we're part of um, several groups that belong to. Uh, NISAR, as it's called, so it's the Department of Justice manage this, um, and the registered maintained to provide assurance of quality. So that is an important sort of arbiter of, of standards for all voluntary search and rescue groups. So the, the mountain rescue teams, community rescue, we're all part of that. It doesn't stop certain people still and all the same to somebody, we're a search dog group, uh, they're not affiliated, but they will still intrude. And people like that can be very dangerous. So, Sarda Ireland North, Dogs and Handlers, these are just some of the guys that, that are there. Now, there's a mixture of people here. This guy's a paramedic, he's a, uh, an award winning chef. This guy over here is um, civil service. This guy's IT. The lad at the top there is clearly psychiatric nurse. So there's a, a whole array of, of, of different people in the groups. So some examples to start out in North search dog specializations. Now, urban search dogs, urban search and rescue dogs, have several different tasks to do. What they do when they find a missing person, so for example, this guy here, what, what they do is they will stay and bark at wherever the scent is coming up through the rubble. They won't move back to tell the handler the way a mountain rescue dog will do. They will stay there and bark and bark and bark until the handler arrives. 
So they've got to be capable of going over rough ground like that, wobbly on certain surfaces, planks, and all the rest. Um, so I was at the Lockerbie Air Crash many years ago, and that was very traumatic. But we were also involved, uh, our dogs were involved in uh, bombs elsewhere and um, in the 9 11. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, the dogs also have to learn to be safe in a, in a harness like this. So this is working with the fire service, and they'll haul the dogs up or, or lower them down as required, so that they can search at higher buildings that have collapsed, but they're, they're pancake. So you have to get up really high. And in one earthquake I was in, in uh, uh, Turkey many years ago, um, I had to get up in a higher sort of area to search for a missing person. And there was no way of getting them up, and I had no harness. But there was an old ladder there. And I put the dogs, it was called Dylan, and I put a street in front of the ladder and said, whoops, son. And I stood behind him, and to my amazement, he walked up this ladder, got onto the thing, and searched away. He was a terrific dog. Yeah, and actually, where the people, the local people were digging in this trench, and they said they were convinced this person was here, I put the dog into the trench, he ignored it, with nothing there, and he went further over, and there was a big wall lying at an angle, about 20 feet high, lying at a really steep angle, I don't know what was supporting it, and Dylan went to the base of that, and started scratching and digging a hole, and sticking his nose down and barking there, so the fire brigades were saying to me, look, there's no way we can search that. It's too dangerous. We need to get a, a heavy lift crane to support it and all that. Um, so what we do is we put a microphone down and we try to see if there is somebody there. So they did that, and they were communicating to a Turkish person with this individual who was surrounded by various other people who were all dead. He was the only survivor. And we talked to him for about 20 minutes or something. And then this uh, Swiss dog hunter came along and asked us what we were doing and she had all badges on her and the dog was covered in badges and <laughs> we said what we were doing and uh, she said well I'll search it. So she searched the area and then the dog barked and then she said you know the person's dead. And I how do you know that? And she said he's dead because the way my dog barks um, I know <laughs> the dead person from the dead person and he's definitely dead. And so she said thank you very much and then she went away off down the road and the dog continued to bark all the way down the road. And we continue to talk to this dead person. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what you make. So here's an example of um, this is Buzz doing a first search on. Can you see it? Can you see yeah. the lights on? It's, it's not a great picture, but that's a quarry site. It's really, really difficult ground. And he's been taught, basically, he has been taught to work his way around this sort of stuff. And this person hidden up at the back for him. It's not so much making it difficult for him to find the person as can he search the rubble on his own. And you can see the hand standing here not saying anything. So when you do collapse structure work like this, you're expected to stand well clear of the danger zone and let the dog do all the work. I know it's not fair to the dog, but that's the way it, it has to be, really. So he has to work his way through that, and all the time he's searching for scent coming out from the rubble or the person who's jammed between something. You can see the guy here. But the dog can't, if you remain still, the dog won't see you as a rule. Now, once he finds him, he has to stay there and bark until the handler comes to him to reward him. And that's an absolute. So there's no commands given. <coughs> and there's no response of any casualty at all. So this is to encourage the dog to keep barking because he knows he is his toy. <laughs> and then eventually then the hunter will make his way over to him and reward him. So that's the basis of training a dog for collapse structure work. So we are now part of uh, an international team which works through uh, an overall umbrella group called INSERAI, which is the international sort of search and rescue um, umbrella group that monitors all search dog training like this and makes sure that they all meet 
the, 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 the very high standards that are required. Um, so, Sort of Ireland North, these are, these are just, this actually um, is a group of our fellows and some of the international team uh, training in, in Paris recently. Um, this is the recent earthquake that occurred to give you an idea of the sort of stuff that the dogs are asked to find. Um, it was actually me here many years ago in, um, in Turkey with uh, an old dog called Dylan. And here we have a dog just training to search a rubble pile. And when the hander thinks the dog is bound, the dog gives the bark, he has to put his hands up to show. And then the, the examiner is going to say whether he's right or wrong. And it's very tightly controlled. So these are some of the things we've been involved in. Um, <clears throat> the probably, and you can see from this that when you're actually searching a, a collapsed building, what the fire brigade will do is they'll cut their way down through the various floors, and then you put the dog down, and the dog has to be independent enough to go and search in underneath the rubble on his own. So we don't put any harnesses or collars or jackets or anything to get on the dogs. They're all completely free, so there's nothing to catch. Um, and in this particular case, there was nobody in that. Um, this one here was uh, up in... Um, uh, Masafravad, which was uh, way up in the northern end of Kashmir, and that was a particularly bad one because I, an ex-teacher, I was 30 years teaching, and um, most of the most of the dead there were, were secondary school kids. It was hard to deal with. So that's the urban search dog. Now the drowned victim search dog. This is where we train dogs to find the bodies of a dead person who's under the water. The dog works in the boat, like you can see, that's burned. And she's working in the boat, so the boat would be going across the wind. I'll explain more in a minute about how she does that. And then uh, she's been trained that when she finds the odour of decomposition, she must indicate that. So she does that by barking or some other way that's unique to, to her finding that odour. So she, these human remains detection dogs are drowned victim search dogs. We introduced them here in the 80s to the UK. Up to then, they had never been uh, used. The Americans had been doing work with the, with uh, dogs of this sort, but not in the UK. And in fact, the police, when I started it off in the 80s in, in the UK a year, um, said that we don't need to worry about that. The person will come up eventually themselves, but that really doesn't really cut the muster for somebody who's loved one is missing. You need to get them as quickly as possible. This was a search recently for a man up in a, a six mile water. So, uh, and she, this was a lot many rescues boat, so we would work with whoever, whichever volunteer groups are available. And then she perches herself, that's little Nelly, she perches herself on the front um, of that. And um, whenever I mentioned fern there, I just briefly tell you about the bond that comes between dogs and, and us. Is that when fern died, she devastated me. She died two years ago, and it's three years, two years ago now. And three days after she died, I was went in for a coffee at a local shop, and they were asking me how are you feeling about fern being dead. And I could speak to them, they'd seen it on Facebook, because my daughter puts it up there. So I went out and sat in my car, and it was in an awful state. I had my arms folded and the keys were in my pocket. I was thinking about Fern, really upset, and all the four windows of my car went bang, and they all dropped down into the doors. And then separately, the sunroof went bang, and it opened. And I still don't know. I'm supposed to be a scientist. I have no idea <laughs> what that was about. I really don't. Know. But I, I felt this is my wee girl saying, it's okay, you know, you can let me go here. So, gases from decaying body rise to the surface and they're affected by various uh, variables. These are just four of the variables. That a thermocline is just a, a difference in temperature in the water and the, the scent will be trapped by the thermocline will go underneath until it gets a break and then it'll come through. That can be quite confusing for a dog. So how does this work? So this is just a wee uh, thing to let you see what we're at. So the scent comes to the surface breaks the surface, it's carried by the wind, and then the purpose then of the dog is to find where that scent is and bring us to it. So 
what happens is when it leaves the surface, it will expand into a big cone, a massive cone, which is carried by the wind. Depending on how strong the wind is, it depends on the way the cone works. But the dog's job is to sort of find that. Now, see, the set cone will vary with the strength of the wind. So if you imagine a light wind, you have a very wet cone, and then a strong wind, you have a very narrow cone. The problem the dog has then, and the handler has then, is when the dog indicates on the scent cone which type of cone is it and how far would the person be. It's quite a complicated process, as you'll see now. So assume the body location is there and the scent cone is, is blowing downwind like that. The problem here is, if you start downwind and you work up across the wind, zigzag like that, the dog may indicate there, as you see, or here, or there. The problem is here that you don't know exactly where the person is. All you know is the dog saying it's upwind somewhere. So what we would do then is we would take the dog completely away from the scent and we would move away upwind, way, way, way upwind. And then we would drive the boat across the wind and work our way back down, zigzagging down, Maybe every 50 meters we'll go down and then drive across maybe three or 400 meters that way and then drop down 50 meters and then another three or 400 meters that way and so on. Until eventually the dog will indicate. Then we know if we've done 50 meter uh, parallel legs that the person is somewhere like 50 meters upwind of us. So we've narrowed the big, big lake down to one small area and that's when the divers would be involved. Now here's an example of uh, Nelly, who's my new dog, if I can get this to go here, searching for somebody down in a lake outside Uri. Now, it'll go on, but you can see the boats go quite slowly. So she's searching away there on the front of the boat. She's obviously enjoying herself. <laughs> And when she finds where the person is, and this is actually a live search, a person who's actually got a problem there, they had committed suicide, so they'd gone out into the lake, nobody knew where they were exactly, but the car was parked and so on. So she's basically trying to find along the shoreline where they might be. And it goes slowly to that, and the video gets a bit better as it goes. When she finds the scent, she'll go over the side, she'll go right over the side of the boat, and then she'll turn and she'll look at me. And the reason that I ask her to do that rather than bark is that when dogs bark on the boat like that, people on the shore think, oh, he's found the person. And the dog may not have found the person, it could be some other reason it's barking. So we just keep them silent at the moment. So if you watch now, she's actually coming to where the fella actually is, and there she's over the side, and then she turned her head to try to tell me I found him, and I'm pretending I don't know this. We deliberately do that just to double check. The danger with her is that she will, she falls over the side, so I have to have a, a rope on her to make sure. It's happened a few times with her. So what we do now is we take, so the wind is actually coming from the right hand side of the boat, back over here. And so what we're doing is we're bringing her down a wee bit and back across the wind just to check. This boat now belongs to Community Rescue Service, who are a big organization. They have over 300 members, I think, at the minute. Um, and they do great work of finding people who are missing. They, they were the ones who found uh, the, uh, Mr. Whiteside there recently in Loch Ney. They searched for him for 51 days, every single day. They put people out on the shore. It was very, very good. We searched for him as well. So we come around again, and um, basically she'll just do the same thing, but we now know that he's in an area, we can mark it on the shore, you take bearings on the shore as you're going, and you just watch what the dog does. But you have to be patient. And people think it's a relatively easy thing to do. This is very, very difficult, because there's so many variables involved in it. So, there you go again. So, Years ago, I had a friend in Sweden who, who's an expert in this, and he was telling me, I was saying, um, he said to me, we were training on a lake, and he says, do you think the dog is found? And I said, yes, I think he has. 
And he said, well, why are you not rewarding him? And I said, because he's not barking. I trained him to bark. He said, can you not tell from his body language that he's found him? You don't need the dog to bark. And that was actually a very salutary lesson for me. We, we hang up too much of, in America. One of the things they do, in a recent experiment, actually I was reading about this recently, and I better tell, I'll tell you what, I'll save that for later because it's just astonishing, like nonsense some of these American people talk. I don't know American people. It doesn't mean to be disrespectful, but some of these people. So the second, so the first one was urban search, then you have drowned victim, and these then are called scent specific trailing dog. Now this guy here is a black and tan American coon hound. It's basically a bloodhound with a bit of something else added in. Um, so he's called, oh geez, terrible. Uh, I'll just say now, that bit there, and uh, I do that. Before searching then, they're asked to smell an article of clothing belonging to the missing person. It can be a pillowcase, it can be a glove, it can be a hat. It can even be the seat of a car. And we would swab the seat with a, a, a medicated uh, sterile uh, swab um, with a bit of moisture in it, put it out in a bag, leave it sit there for maybe five minutes to let the bacteria get involved, and then present that to the dog, and the dog will actually follow the scent from that. So the first thing is, find an article that the dog will smell. <laughs> so in this case, in case you can't see it, it says, dude, find it yourself. Um, and they're presenting them with someone's savory father Ted type underpants. Anyway, let's go to work. So, um, unfortunately, that sort of right went off there slightly. But um, what we do is we train the dogs to work for effectively for 12 hours after somebody goes missing. You can stretch it to 24 hours. In one case, uh, Patty, the brown dog, I showed you, found a girl up in Valley Castle 36 hours after she had gone missing. Absolutely solid trail for about a mile to exactly where the first soul had fallen off a cliff. And um, so that kind of task there, it, that's the judge herder there. This girl's the paramedic, she's just on training in Caswell. But what happens is the dog is linking together all the pockets of scent that he finds. So as you walk along, scent is coming from the top of our heads from our breath, and it's carried by the wind, and then at the lodge along the edge here, or along the curves here, and the, uh, or cat's eyes in the middle of the road, or whatever, or on the wall. And the dog is actually just following the, the, the line of scent. Now, there was an experiment done in Queens there a few years ago with um, uh, Professor Heffer and Debbie Wells, and what they did was they worked with fish dogs, and they brought the dog, so the the, um, a person laid a track from A to B, say 200 yards long. They brought the police dog along at right angles to the track and were interested to see, can the dog detect which way the person went? And the dogs inevitably were able to find the direction of travel within 1.4 meters. So the dog would go this way and reject that and we'll go this way and realize that the scent this way is fresher. Now that's astonishing, 1.4 meters. So the dog's able to work out which direction to travel. Now I'll show you my little trailing dog in a second, uh, do, doing a, an it, in fact here he is here. Um, what, what he's been asked to do, this young trainee called Gorka, he's been sent in an, on the article and he's asked, find him. Now, find him means, show me where that scent starts, wherever the scent is. I'm not sure where it starts. And then, once he has found that, he has to sit. That says to me, now I've found where the, so I've matched the scent from this article to the scent on the ground. Once he's got that, then he's told, show me. And that means to him, he's, uh, take me along this trail now to wherever this missing person is. So this is his fourth day of training. And it's in Tullymore, uh, Tullymore Forest Park. And he's been brought away from the trail altogether. The trail's over here on this road. So there's no trail, there's no scent here at all. He's been scented. And now he's been asked, show me where this trail starts. 
So he comes onto the road, and the wind is blowing towards the hedge. So that's why he's going in around here. And then when he finds the trail, then he's got to demonstrate that to me by sitting on his own. So he makes sure, and then he sits. Not only does he sit, but he sits pointing in the direction that the person has gone. And he wasn't taught that. He just taught that himself. And they're all doing that at the minute. So now he kicked the line off his car, took it onto his harness. So that's a, a key to him that now you're going to do the second part of this exercise. It's not a very clear video, uh, but I was using my phone actually. I don't know why, I just thought I'd have a go at this. So he's going to, now the wind is blowing the scent to the left side of that, tra that track. And that's why he's focusing over there. And he sort of varies because who knows how far away the wind will blow. And the longer you leave it, like say 24 hours, the further away the scent's going to be blown. And that's why it gets more and more difficult for dogs to find after that period of time. Some people in America would claim the dog would find 36 days after somebody's got missing, but I mean, that's stretching, uh, that's stretching a little bit, I think. I think the optimum level is 12 hours to 24, maybe, at the, at the outside. So he's working his way through this. And you can see how much he varies off to the left with the strength of the wind. Comes to a barrier here. And then he has to establish, right, where do they go now? And the person's actually turned right down here. But the wind is coming from the right. So what happened here is the person went, you see a building now, the person went to the left of the building and then hid behind the building. But he goes to the right simply because all the wind is coming from the person to him and he's matched that scent to this missing person. And then he's working it out himself, and hopefully we'll find it. And there's the person there. And then he gets, now his reward is a ball. That's all he's interested in. Play with the ball, talk it as much as you can. So a mountain search dog now, these are being asked to search in the worst of weathers and nearly always at night. And the dog and the handler have to be confident. The handler needs to know, I can navigate my way wherever I am, no matter what the conditions, and the dog has to be safe. So and the uh, first part of this training is here. This is stage one. And all that happens here, I like to see now, is this guy here runs off. And this is the new dog. And the dog is called Buttercup. <laughs> Buttercup, can you imagine? Like, like Bruce has a ring to it. But and this man here is the nicest guy I ever you meet. He's a retired vet. Um, and Buttercup now has never done this before. She just watched this guy run off into these trees here. And she just told to find him. The wind is blowing straight at her. The person's gone to the left. And she has to work out herself where he is. So she's doing that on herself. The other dogs are watching this over the side here. That's where you're getting all this barking. That's not her barking. And eventually then she works it out. He's not up here, he's down here. And she looks to see where her daddy is. And then she goes down and then the person, you just see the ball get thrown at her there. So that was Buttercup. She's doing very well actually. The trouble is the handler is a wee bit um, forgetful. And one of the things dogs will search for, as I told you, is the ball. And the training officer said to your man the other day, uh, Chris, have you got uh, uh, Buttercup's toy with you? Um, and he says, toy? What toy? Have you not got the ball? Why the ball? Why? I, I think it's a home. <laughs> 40 miles away. So anyway, we managed. So when somebody thinks they're being clever and they hide in nets and all the rest of it, doesn't matter to the dog. The dog is only interested in odor. That's all he's following. They don't really use their eyes at all when they're doing it. So normally when we're searching then, the person will get well and truly hidden. Um, and that's an area of a pigeon mountain uh, on the moorings. It's, it's quite a rough area here. And when you see, I think we we'll get this here. This is where the young dog has been taught when you find a person, you must bark. 
So this is her first stage. Of, so the hunter is down there somewhere. She's found the person, and all we want her to do is bark, bark at the person at this stage. The next part of her training will require her to come back to the handler and bark at the handler um, and bring then the handler back. But by barking at the, at the person in that way, not right in their face, but sort of away from them, it's a reassurance to the person in the sense that uh, I've been found here. So this little one here, now this is a, a, a more advanced stage. The dog has now searched the whole big area the handler is up here, you can just make him out, up here, and then the dog is just approaching. This is German Shepherd, and <clears throat> she has worked, the wind is blowing that way there, so she's worked out where the person is. She finds the person, and now with any, without any commands at all, she's looking to see where her handler is. She makes her way back to her handler, and then she has to tell the handler that she's found this person. And then the handler will be brought back, no matter how far away it is. And you hear her bark. And then show me, and then the dog brings him all the way back. Now that dog, that was uh, about two months before it was being assessed. So when we assess a mountain rescue dog, we go to the Highlands of Scotland, we go to Glen Coe uh, or Fort William. We're going to Fort William down another three weeks, four weeks. And we work with the Scottish mountain rescue team. So the Scottish search and rescue dogs, they, uh, they're the ones who introduced the concept of search dogs in the mountain um, in the 60s. It was a Hamish McGuinness who was the first to do that, having gone to uh, the Alps and seen the dogs working in the Alps. And he thought, I can adapt that to here. And he decided he would start uh, working on that. And it's come from Hamish McGuinness. Hamish McGuinness died there a couple of years ago. So that dog in Scotland was given uh, two two hour searches on Friday, followed by two two hour searches on Saturday, followed by another two hour search on Sunday. So quite a lot of searching in really horrendous weather and sheep everywhere. And it was totally faultless. It was absolutely superb. It was the best uh, demonstration I've seen of a search dog. So um, this guy here, let's see if I can get him out of there. One. So here you have uh, an area down in the moors. This uh, is Spalak up here on the right. Uh, the the transit track was up here. The search area for that particular dog was just under where it says search dog, that yellow writing there, all the way up along that ridge, over those cliffs, and right back to here. And he had two hours to search that. And the question is, can you spot the search dog? So let me just see if I can. So the dog is actually just there where that star is, and the hander here. So that is to sort of give you a rough idea of how enormous these areas can be. So the mighty search dog works independently, as I said. So let's say the casualty is lying there and he's alive casually. So the wind is blowing the set this way, and that's a cone. The, the, the hander will search across the cone, will search across the wind, I mean, until he will hit the cone. And the thing about that is that once he hits the cone, the dog has to go upwind, straight to where the casualty is, find the casualty, and then immediately go back to where the hander is. So you can see roughly what happens there. It's fascinating to watch it. So, in summary then, the dog is trained to find the casualty who has his ball, or whatever it is, return to tell his hander by barking, bring the hander all the way back to where he is, and as the hander approaches, the dog will probably continue to bark, and then when the hander arrives, the person will play with the dog. The person plays with the dog, not the hander, and not to get the dog 
to focus on finding the person. Because if the hunter pays the dog, the dog will get cheesed off, work for four or five hours, and say, you know what, I'll just go back and bark at him when I get to play with the ball. So, and they're that cute. So, and of course we love them. So as I say, Sergeant Scotland assesses our dogs for us. It's a peer review, basically. So they'll send two assessors to us, or we'll go to Scotland and we'll be assessed with the other dogs in Scotland. And there'll be somebody there from England as well. And they, you have to be good to get past them because so much depends on it. So police dogs now, where we differ from police dogs is, police dogs will, as it says there, can search open areas for persons uh, discarded items or whatever, and will stand and bark. Usually they work on the line because the dogs are kind of used to work with uh, people who may not want to be found particularly, um, put, put in a gap. Um, they can also track the two hours on hard ground. Um, again, they're not sense specific. So if somebody breaks into a car, runs off over a field, the dog will follow him very accurately, provided nobody else has gone across that field. But if somebody else has crossed it, then the dog can be, can be put off. But they are very good at what they do. Um, the short hour training dogs will only follow the person who sent you give them. As I said, we told, and this was actually a search up in uh, outside Derry, stroke London Derry, for a guy who uh, was a drug dealer and had given the police to slip and run over the border. And this is uh, uh, Magnus, that boy there, searching for him. And we, we discovered he got over the border. He was found later on, but anyway, he was injured like it. I don't know what exactly happened to him. But to sum up, Sarda dogs do things slightly differently than police dogs. So when a Sarda dog finds the person he's missing, the person will play with him. Police dogs, on the other hand, <laughs> have a slightly different approach <laughs> to the whole thing. <laughs> so, and you know, I mean, like I have the highest regard for them, so I'm not not going to talk. So now, that's the search dog bit, and now I come on to the the research that we're doing at Queens, um, and I have to say there that those two men there, Doc Alistair Ruffle and Gareth Barnett. Uh, Gareth is in charge of uh, research at the School of Biological Sciences, and G Alistair is really a forensic scientist, a geologist, geographer, he's a great guy, but totally open-minded. We've discovered through, anecdotally, I heard that dogs were able to predict epileptic seizure, and I'd never heard of it in my life before, and I decided I'd love to find out more about this, and coincidentally, uh, this professor Hepper was doing to work with police dogs and he invited me to Queen's to talk to him about scent and whatever. And during the course of that, he asked me what I was doing with dogs and I said, well, I've got this real interest in uh, epilepsy and dog predicting seizures and so on. And he said, well, would you like to write a paper on that with me? And I said, no, actually, I know I wouldn't. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, what about doing a PhD? And I said, well, yeah, I would, because it's work with it. My master's is in psychotherapy, working with people who've been traumatized one way or another because of my own experiences at Lockerbie, um, and where we were all very badly traumatized. So this area of work had nothing to do with my master's, but at the same time, I, I, I thought, when he said to me, well, what about doing a PhD? I thought, right, absolutely. And that's, that's what happened. I did a survey, the first part of the PhD was a survey that went around the world and said to people in epilepsy centers, do you have a pet dog that predicts your seizure? And if it does, how does it do it? So there were something like 300 responses. 96% of them said, yes, my dog does predict my seizures. I've never trained it in my life. And they were all doing it in three ways. There, there was actually 11 ways, but the three principal ways were uh, by touching them or nudging or by staring intensely at them. And if that didn't work, they would bark. Now, the, most of the the demonstrations of this is what you would call affiliative behavior. So the dog appears to have 
um, develop this need to tell the owner something's not right with you. Why? I have no idea. And there's a study done not that long, in 2014, which shows that 78% of communication between dogs and, and people is with their eyes. 72% is by uh, touch, and around about 65% is by vocalizing in some way. I put those in the wrong order, but it doesn't really matter. The, the three principal ways then are by coming and staring at you, but if you're watching TV, you'll miss that. So then what the dogs do is they revert then to nudging you. And I'll show you a video in a minute of this actually happening. And then they'll vocalize in some way. To me, it's just beyond, I'm just, I'm blown away with this. They do it also for diabetes. They do it for Addison's disease. They do it for post-traumatic stress, uh, if somebody reverts to that. Any amount of different conditions will cause this. So, we needed to test this. So my logic was, if pet dogs are doing this, if I take 20 pet dogs and expose them to the odor of epilepsy, surely they should react the way these people are claiming their dogs are reacting. I'm going to watch my time here. I'm not going to, am I running over here? No. No. I, okay. I'll zip through this. So, I, I had to find a way of, of, so what I did was I designed this piece of apparatus which is shown there. Basically, I'll show you a bit more detail in a minute. But essentially, I have to have a way of getting sent from here to where the owner was sitting. And then we brought the dogs in, and the idea was, what is the dog going to do when he detects this owner? So this is the way I set it up. Now, I had a hard time convincing Dr. Arnott that this was worth doing. So he said, this piece of apparatus you've designed has to be validated, which means you need to prove that it works. So I got, I wrote to the police, and the police very kindly provided, I think it was something like 10 police dogs or like drugs dogs or whatever. And we basically, instead of getting the dogs to search a room, we used this system of basically a pump a scent chamber and a big long tube and we let the tube come out under a chair or in a corner of a cupboard or something and the dog was asked to go and find it and if the dog found it then that validates the apparatus which is what happened all the dogs were able to do that so the person sitting in the in the middle of the laboratory and they've got well you'll see in a second they've got one of these dogs this is Taz now Taz unfortunately has died now he's pretty sober so first we gave Taz the odor of non-epileptic seizure. So in other words, I'll show you now this, you're going to see a video here. So there's non-epileptic odor coming through here. Now there's two tubes under the owner's, see the two green pipes? Two little green pipes. One is for control, which is non-epilepsy. One is for epilepsy. So at the minute we're pumping out non-epilepsy odor and we're asking Taz nothing he's just walking around in the garden she's not allowed to engage with him at all so we keep the thing very objective and the as you see he's been video from here now what he's done is he's cleared off he's gone wandering around the lab he'd come back in a minute and have a look at um, Anne and then he'd clear off again because he's Nothing interesting. There's nothing interesting happening here. So he's just trying to get her attention. She's ignoring him, and then he clears off. So as far as he's concerned, Boredom City, right? Or no. Now what we did was we put the odor of epilepsy through the pipe, and we brought Taz back into the room again. So now there's epilepsy odor coming out. First thing he does is go straight to her and he looks at me, that's me over there, for help. Looks around at Professor Arnott, who's right here. Tries, he now starts staring at her and he sits beside her. Now he's not going to leave her. Now why? I have no idea why. 
But that odor has triggered that response in him. When all of this fails, he then goes to the next level. He's getting really agitated, and now he really is trying to get her attention. And you have to realize here that no one has said a word to him. It's all been done by himself. I couldn't believe it myself. Now, we did this with 20 dogs, and all 20 of them demonstrated the, these behaviors, some more intensely than others. Some were jumping up on the laps of the people. Some were licking their mouths. But effect effectively, they were all doing the same thing, which is showing this concern and behavior. So the result was, when Paz detected the non-seizure scent, he wasn't really interested, and when he detected the seizure-related scent, he became very clingy, looked at Anne more than normal, and also uh, turned to engage other people in the room. All done without any training whatsoever. And that brings us to just a glimpse of the incredible world of light sleeping dogs. That's what we call a lion sleep, just in case you couldn't make it out. And there we go. generalize because they do for diabetes detection too uh, and they will actually generalize to other people um, now the interesting thing is that when I was sorry when I was doing my research um, we were focusing on epilepsy but I'm now doing postdoctoral work and we're looking at things called associative seizures and dogs are doing the same thing for non-epileptic seizures as they are for epileptic seizures they look the same but they're not the same and we're working with the neurology department at the Royal with this. We're, we're only just starting the um, actual research process very shortly. Somebody. Else? So just, there's, there's, there's a couple of questions here. I've got two. So sorry. So sorry. That's uh, that's every year. I'm just wondering for the difference between males and female dogs in terms of strength. So do they both operate? They both. It's very a good question. The question was, is it males or females are better at it? Basically, they're both the same, and any age and any breed can do it. Uh, the biggest number of responses we got were from dogs like, um, you know, we lap dogs like, like Cairn Terriers and. Um, Bichon Freeze and that type of thing. Uh, there was a big number of those, but uh, gun dogs, shepherds, any type of dog can do it. And any age. Anything else? Any other questions? Oh, I've got loads. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start here. Okay, I'll start with this one then. Uh, first and rescue dog, it's wild, he's trained, and it's also yeah, trained the so yeah, if, if, a, if a dog is trained to do searching, you know, searching oh, yeah. rescue in the mountains, can they also yeah. find a dog, find a person at a disaster site or an earthquake? Oh, they can, they can. But the thing is, basically they're air sending. But the thing is that in a 
in a, a rubble pile, you don't want the dog running back and forward to the handler because of the danger to himself. That's so so they, they expect the dog to stand there and bark. So a mountain dog would automatically try to come back to the handler. Yeah. Uh, that said, some mountain dogs are clever enough. They see the handler just 30 feet from them. They know they don't have to come back, so they will transfer that knowledge and just stand there and bark. So a mountain, a mountain rescue dog can be further trained, can they? To do yes, you can. We have one currently is able to do that. Two, actually, okay. are able to do that. Okay, I'm sorry, that's my head. Um, how long does the working life of the dog last? And what happens when it's come to the end of the working life? They, our dogs are all family pets. So they will work as long as they're happy. And if they look unhappy or they're struggling, which you can see long before it becomes an issue, uh, usually around nine, 10, but my old retriever was 12 and he was still wanting to get out and search. But I didn't give him hard work to do, but I was watching him. But when they uh, come to the end of their working life, they just stay with us and live a happy life. Lovely, great. And so that's it, that's everything. Could you just try and speak as well? Oh, you can start it at any age. It, ideally, eight months, nine months is a good time, you know. Uh, but basically, what, to train a dog to detect epileptic seizure or non epileptic seizure, all we do is take samples from under the arm when a person's having a seizure, and we, we imprint the dog on that odor. And the dog is taught that if you find that, you'll be rewarded. Um, and that's really the substance of what we're going to be doing with the next part of the research. I think we've got one last question. Oh, we're up to Martin, Martin, Martin. Just to answer it, because I was curious about how do you get an epilepsy in the scent? But they said, it's very hard to do. One last question here from this lady. Yeah, and that's how does it work um, with the person of, say, an alternate hypoepilepsy? And they're on anti-epileptic drugs. How does it work if the person is nocturnal? nocturnal. Yeah. And then yeah. they're on anti-epileptic drugs, which is trying to just control it. Well, anti-epileptic, anti-seizure drugs will work up to a point, but not always. Um, there will still be these um, gaps where the, the drugs become ineffective. The dog will only demonstrate this when the person's about to have a seizure, and usually it's about a half an hour before that, because we're giving off an odor which is detectable by the dog. Now, one of the clues that led me to see that it was an odor and it wasn't a, a visual thing or anything like that, was that in my research, a lot of dogs came from a, a different room. Somebody sitting watching TV and the dog's lying in the bedroom somewhere. All of a sudden, the dog appears in front of them, telling them they're about to have a seizure. Now, how did the dog know that from another room? Um, I, at one stage, thought it was electromagnetism because dogs have a sensitivity to that, but it's actually an odor. And it's, a, in my view, it's an alarm odor. It's not, there's a study done in America recently that suggests that epilepsy has its own unique odor. But that doesn't explain why dogs re react to non-epileptic seizure in exactly the same way. So to me, it's not the, um, the unique odor to epilepsy. It's an alarm odor, which is triggered by any physiological change in our body, which gives off this, whether it be cortisol or adrenaline or whatever it is. And that's what the dogs are reacting to. And that's what we're hoping to show in this postdoctoral research. You know, what I worry every week for I have a daughter working in London and getting on and off. Huh? What? Sorry. I have a daughter working in London. And she has nocturnal epilepsy, and she's on and off two trains. So I worry a lot in case if she took a seizure. Oh, yes, of course, but yeah. However, it, it has to be controlled at all. Yeah, it's magical what they do. A lot of the medication does have very serious side effects as well. But um, on balance, it's better that they're on that than not on it. You know. I am going to, I'm going to wind things up, but Neil is obviously here, and the books at the back really focus on Neil's search and rescue work. But I mean, obviously, brilliant work going on here, and we encourage you and thank you for it. And thanks very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.